Amen. It's good to be with you uh, this evening. If you've got a copy of God's Word, I hope that you do. Take it and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, one of the things that I've enjoyed so far is that it seems like everything that is said from behind the pulpit, or maybe it was just Chris, is met with an enormous amount of excitement. Can I borrow some of you to come to uh, our church on Sunday and just cheer during our announcements? Yes. Yes. It, that would be really helpful because announcements are my least favorite thing. We're going to look at verses 20 to 23 uh, tonight in 2 Timothy 2. I hope you've turned there, and I hope that you'll follow along with me as we read from God's Word. This is what the Holy Spirit says to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in verse 20. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Friends, this is the word of the Lord given to us for our good. Let's pray and ask God to bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do ask now that you would please illuminate our hearts and minds. I wanna echo the prayer that our brother prayed there at the end of the worship set, that you would indeed change us, that you would work by your word in our hearts, that you would reveal areas where we need to repent, that you would encourage evidences of grace, that you would strengthen us where our faith is weak, that you would admonish us where we have grown idle, where you would teach us, Father, to be patient and to wait upon the Lord. God, please bear fruit from this time now. Please keep me from error. Please grant your people ears to hear hearts to believe, and lives that are ready, Father, to be devoted to you. We ask these things in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. I don't know what it was like growing up in your house, but I grew up with a dad who was quite handy around the home, fixing lots of things. And one of the many lessons that my dad taught me growing up was the importance of using the right tool in the right way for the right job. I'm sure that my dad told me that lesson a ton when I was young, but it wasn't until I grew up and purchased a home of my own that that lesson began to resonate with me more deeply. I remember the night very clearly. My dad and I were there in this first home that I had purchased, and we were replacing the floor in our kitchen. Uh, tearing up the old floorboards and getting ready to put down new floor. And as we tore up the old floor, it was so old that the nails holding it down were exposed there at the top. The, the heads of the nails were exposed and we had to pull all of those nails out before we, could, before we could put the new floor down. After we got all the old floor up, it was pretty late and so dad said, I'm gonna leave, why don't you stay behind and pull up all these nails and tomorrow, uh, tomorrow we'll put down the new floor. Let's just say it didn't go very well after dad left. I spent all night trying to pull those nails out. That house was built in the 1960s and those nails had been in there for a long time and I, they, didn't wanna, they didn't wanna come out. So the next morning when my dad got there, the job wasn't done and I had every tool known to man spread across the floor of the kitchen. Crowbars, hammers, screwdrivers, hacksaws. I had tried everything to get the job done and I couldn't, I couldn't get it done. So with not a little frustration, I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I don't think I have the right tool for the job. My dad, as he often does, disagreed with me. <laughs> he said, yes you do, you're just not using it the right way. And he proceeded to pick up the most common tool in every guy's toolbox, a hammer, but along with that hammer, he picked up this little scrap of a two by four. 
And he went over to the nail and he put the two by four under the head of the hammer and just like that, just like that, pulled the nail out. He looked at me, he said, son, you had the right tool, but you weren't using it the right way. That little bit of leverage makes all of the difference. I had the, I had the right equipment all along, I just didn't employ it in the right way. In a way, friends, the Apostle Paul is teaching Timothy that same lesson in this text, but in a much more significant way. Timothy, you know, is a pastor. He's, a pa- he's probably the pastor of the church at Ephesus at this point. And all through this letter, Paul has reminded Timothy that the word of God is the right tool for his work. The word of God is the good deposit. The scriptures are the word of truth. The gospel is all that Timothy needs for his work as a pastor. He has the right tool. But beginning in verse 20, Paul reminds Timothy that he has to use God's word in the right way like leverage with the hammer that night in my kitchen, it's godliness that equips Timothy to use the word of God in the right way. Friends, that's really the main idea of this short passage. Holiness, holiness equips the Christian to be a faithful, useful servant of the word of God. Holiness is the best way to equip yourself for serving the Lord. Without holiness, Timothy risks misusing God's word, but through holiness, through personal godliness, Timothy is equipped to carry out his work in a useful way. You can see the emphasis on godliness right away in the passage. Look at verses 20 and 21, and notice the analogy that Paul uses to set up his instructions. In verse 20, the apostle envisions a grand house full of various kinds of dishes or vessels. Some of them are made for honorable purposes, like serving the family meal. Some of them have have less honorable purposes, maybe taking out the trash or disposing of waste. In Paul's day, this would have been an illustration that everybody would have understood. You use honorable vessels for honorable work, and you use common vessels for less honorable work. But then notice the way Paul applies the analogy in verse 21. Look at, look at the application he makes. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. That's an effective application, isn't it? Like those honorable vessels in the master's house, God's people, you and I, have been set apart for honorable service in God's church. Therefore, Paul says, be cleansed of every impurity. Be holy just as God set you apart to be. Friends, that's what will make Timothy a useful servant of the word. That's what will make you a useful servant of the word. Godliness. Holiness, removing from your life every sort of defilement. That's the main idea I want to communicate to you tonight. When it comes to serving the Lord Jesus, holiness is the best equipping for faithful service in the master's house. That raises the question that I want us to answer. If we're called to be honorable vessels in service of Christ, How should we cultivate the kind of holiness that equips us to serve? If we're called to be clean, as Paul says in verse 21, which we are, how do we put that call into practice? How do we prepare ourselves to be useful servants? Well, in this text, Paul gives Timothy three specific practices for cultivating godliness, Three practices that will make him a useful servant in God's house. Let's consider those three practices together. Practice number one, a faithful servant flees impulsive immaturity. A faithful servant flees impulsive immaturity. The command that begins verse 22 is straightforward. Flee 
youthful passions, Paul says. The sense of that command is just as it sounds. Timothy must flee, run from, avoid youthful passions. This is the same command that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 6 when he tells Christians to flee sexual immorality. It's the same command that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 10 when he tells believers to flee idolatry. When it comes to sin, a faithful Christian's first response should always be to flee, get away, run. Now, you might be thinking, this is pretty basic stuff, Jeff. We go to a Bible college. Of course, we know that Christians are to flee from sin. I already know that. That's not the issue, friends. The issue is not, do you know this? The issue is, do you do it? And if we're honest, if we're honest, we often fail to follow this basic command, don't we? Instead of fleeing from sin, we like to come and get right up close enough to the edge to see what it's like, but not so far that we go over. We like to get close enough to experience some of the attraction that comes with sin, but not so close that we have begun to experience conviction. Can you relate to that? I can. That's why Paul's command in verse 22 may be basic, but it's also necessary. The command is not, don't get too close to sin. The command is flee. Run from it. Get away. Get as far away from sin as you can. You'll notice also in verse 22 that Paul specifies what Timothy is to flee from. Look what he says. Flee youthful passions, Paul writes. We need to be clear on Paul's point. By youthful passions, he does not mean hobbies or other things that you might be interested in. In the New Testament, the word passions often describes sexual immorality, both in terms of thought and actions. And that is certainly included in verse 22. Timothy, like all faithful Christians, must flee from any form of sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, coarse joking, pornography, immoral behavior. Friends, those practices do not make you fit for useful service in the master's house. So I don't want to take this moment for granted. If there is even a hint of sexual immorality in your life, then verse 22 should get your attention. Don't tolerate such sin. Don't toy around with sexual immorality in any form. Run, run. Tonight, resolve to flee. Delete whatever you have to delete. It's not worth your soul. Confess whatever you have to confess. Get as far away from sin as you can. Don't wait, don't linger, don't think one second longer. Run, flee. That is certainly one of the applications in verse 22. At the same time, Paul's command also goes deeper than sexual immorality. Notice the adjective that Paul adds in verse 22. Flee youthful passions. This is the only place in the New Testament that this adjective is used. But when it's combined with the word passions, you get a sense of Paul's point. Timothy is to flee the kind of impulsive behavior that so often marks immaturity. You know what I'm talking about. A tendency to speak too quickly. Overestimating how much you know, particularly when compared to other people. A quickness to lose your temper. A propensity to be rash, to take action before you think things through. An insistence on your own way. Typically, those kind of impulsive responses mark 
youthfulness. And that's what Paul means here by youthfulness. It's not necessarily an age thing, it's a maturity thing. So run from situations that encourage or reward you to be impulsively immature. Run from those. And guard your own heart in response to them. When I was 20 years old, I went to a Bible study class at a church uh, near the University of Arkansas, and the class was basically on what this church believed, and you had to go to the class before you could participate in the Bible study. I was 20. I had been reading the Bible thoughtfully for a grand total of four months. And in this class, the teacher explained for the first time ever in my hearing what are sometimes called the doctrines of grace. He explained to me, unconditional election, total depravity, all of those things. First time I'd heard it, been reading the Bible for four months. My response to him was to tell him that he was a heretic. That's youthful passions. That's youthful passions. That's impulsive responses that are not driven by truthfulness, not driven by humility, but driven by pride. Paul says, run from those kind of responses. Friends, is your life marked by those kinds of youthful passions? Are you prone to speak quickly before you think? Do you insist on your own way, believing that your experience or your insight is what a situation most needs? Do you lose your temper quickly in word or in attitude? Are you rash? Are you sharp-tongued? If so, then verse 22 should get your attention. This is baseline godliness. Flee that kind of impulsive behavior. Most often it leads to sin. So run from it. Get away. You'll notice, however, that verse 22 doesn't stop with flee. Timothy is also to pursue what makes for godliness. That's the second practice that prepares us for being useful servants. Practice number two, a faithful servant pursues self-controlled character. Pursues self-controlled character. Let's start at the beginning of the verse and let's read the whole thing again so that we get a sense of Paul's entire command. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Again, the command is straightforward. If to flee is to run from something, then to pursue is to run toward something else. So before we go any further, I hope you see how verse 22 gives you both sides of growing in godliness. Sanctification. Sanctification, you know, is the progressive process by which we're becoming more like Christ in our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions. And verse 22 reminds us that sanctification has, has two sides. There's both fleeing and pursuing. So to grow as a Christian, I have to deliberately flee from sin, but equally important, I also have to deliberately, purposefully pursue the things that make for righteousness. It's not just enough to flee, I have to pursue it also. I think this is a reminder that we need. I don't know if you grew up in the same kind of uh, tradition that I did, but the tradition that I grew up in pretty much talked about sanctification only from the negative. For me, the Christian life was boiled down to, here's the five things that you absolutely should not do. And if you don't do those, then you're probably good. That was the whole perspective, was negative. And that negative resistance is certainly needed. I just spent 10 minutes telling you to flee from sin. The negative is certainly needed. But if we reduce godliness solely to the negative, then we miss so much of the gospel's power. Part of the reason, listen to me, part of the reason we ought to grow in godliness is that holiness satisfies your soul. Becoming more like Christ is good for you. There's great delight in righteousness. There's great gain in godliness. 
And if we only emphasize the negative, if we only think about all the things we must not do, we miss the gospel's power to satisfy our souls. So I don't want to take this moment for granted. Holiness is better than sin. Let me say it again. Holiness is better than sin. Flee from sin, absolutely, but don't stop there. Pursue righteousness. Run hard after knowing Christ and becoming more like him. In fact, part of the way that God strengthens you to flee from sin is through the pursuit of righteousness that satisfies your soul. You can mark it down. Just mark it down, friends. Sin will always turn to ash in your mouth at some point. What tastes good today will be poison to your soul tomorrow. It will always turn to ash in your mouth. But Christ will never fail to satisfy your soul. So taste and see that the Lord is good. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. When that kind of pursuit happens in your life, what does the old hymn say? The things of this world will grow strangely dim. Why? Because we rationally deduce that we're not going to do that anymore? No, because in the light of his glory and grace, I don't want them. Flee and pursue. What am I supposed to be pursuing, we ask? What am I running after? That's a great question. Notice Paul's answer in the verse, verse 22. We are to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Andreas Kostenberger, in his helpful commentary on 2 Timothy, points out that these virtues are the opposite of youthful passions. Righteousness is the opposite of any sexual immorality. Faith is the opposite of self-reliance. Love is the opposite of insisting on your own way. And peace is the opposite of quarrelsome. I think that's a helpful insight. Righteousness, faith, love, and peace are foundational virtues for Christian maturity. They're the opposite of youthful passions. And I wish that we could talk about each one individually, but we don't have time to do that. So I'm just going to summarize what What's the thread that ties together all four of those virtues? Righteousness, faith, love, and peace. What's the thread that ties them together? Self-control. That's how I would summarize it. Self-control. What am I supposed to be pursuing to grow in godliness? Short answer, self-control. We flee youthful passions and we pursue any practice that encourages us to restrain the impulses of the flesh. Righteousness, faith, love, and peace. That sounds like a hard way to live, doesn't it? Well, let's just be honest. Youthful passions come easy. Self-control and godliness do not. That's why Paul gives one more instruction in verse 22. Notice the last phrase. I'm so glad this last phrase is in the verse. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Friends, that's a reminder of how deeply you need other Christians to help you flee from sin and pursue righteousness. Sanctification doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in the body of Christ as you have other believers who help you to call upon the name of the Lord. So if the Holy Spirit has brought any level of conviction to your heart in these first two points, then one of the best steps that you can take tonight before you go to sleep is to reach out to another Christian and ask for their help to grow. Share with them where the Lord has convicted you. Share where you want to grow and then ask that other Christian to do what only another Christian can do for you. Pray. Pray. That's how spiritual growth happens within the fellowship of the saints along with those who call upon the Lord. So don't try to do the fleeing and pursuing on your own. Pursue those virtues with other believers. Remember, the primary place that you find other Christians is the local church. So I sure hope that you have deep 
friendships here on campus, and I don't doubt that you do, but don't overlook the local church, friends. Next to the word of God and the Holy Spirit, the local church is the most effective means of growing you in godliness. It is the school of holiness where God intends to tutor you through the life of other Christians. Pursue that godliness along with your brothers and sisters in the church. That emphasis on relating to other Christians takes us right into the final practice. We wanna be useful servants to the Lord and since we need the ministry of others, practice number three, a faithful servant guards against divisive words. A faithful servant guards against divisive words. Earlier in the letter, Paul instructed Timothy to teach the church to avoid quarrels that disrupt unity. In verse 23, Paul repeats that command, but now he has a particular focus on Timothy's life. Look again at verse 23. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Friends, that command is actually part of a theme that runs through this whole section of the letter. And that theme has to do with the effect of our words on relationships with other people. I, notice just briefly back in verse 14, just look up a few verses. Verse 14, remind them not to quarrel about words, which does no good. Then two verses later, verse 16, avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And now verse 23, have nothing to do with foolish ignorant controversies. So three times in just a span of a few verses, this same theme shows up. Be careful about your words. I know that the controversies probably involve some doctrinal content, but the core of it is don't argue over words. Don't use your words to divide. Don't get drawn into foolish controversies. It's a consistent theme through this section of the letter. But within that consistent theme, Paul adds a new detail. Look at verse 23 and why Timothy is to avoid foolish controversies. Look at the end of the verse. You know that they breed quarrels. That's really vivid language. If you slow down to think about it, like a virus, quarrelsome words mutate into more controversies. The offspring of irreverent babble is even more worthless chatter. It's really such a striking image, quarrels breeding quarrels. Here's the question that I ask as I read that. I understand that quarrels breed other quarrels. Divisive words create division. I understand that. But where is that breeding ground for such controversy? Where's the primary place where that kind of quarrelsomeness is birthed? Well, we could certainly say in other people, right? We could certainly point to the lives of other people and say controversies and quarrels are birthed in them as they're arguing about other words. But I don't think that's the point that Paul's making in verse 23. There's a deeper, more fundamental place where the breeding of quarrels can happen. You know where it is? It's in our own hearts. I'll argue that's Paul's concern in, boy, in verse 23. Why should Timothy avoid foolish controversies? Because it will breed a quarrelsome spirit within his own heart that divides him from the body of Christ, that makes him less likely to love his brothers and sisters. That's why Paul tells Timothy to have nothing to do with foolish controversies. It's about more than maintaining good relationships with other people. It's about Timothy's need to cultivate in his own heart a deep-seated willingness to love others. And if I'm always arguing with other people about words, what am I not doing? Loving them. And if that bond of love between me and other Christians grows weaker, guess what else grows weaker? My pursuit of righteousness, because I'm no longer in good fellowship with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Do you see it? So I take verse 23 to be very instructive, have nothing to do with those kinds of controversies. Listen, words matter, not just what we hear, but what we say, and not only what we say, but how we say it. Because, and words matter because words are often the primary shaper 
of our heart's attitude towards other people. The words that we say, the words that we hear, shape our willingness or lack thereof to love other Christians. So I just want to be very direct about verse 23. Not every hot button issue requires your involvement. Not every online controversy needs your words. Just spoiler alert, most of them don't matter anyway. They're not helping to cultivate the kind of heart that loves other Christians. Often, controversies that are supposedly important and urgent are really just breeding grounds for a quarrelsome spirit that divides brother from brother and erodes that charitable spirit that we ought to have. So don't go there. Part of growing in godliness is learning to guard your heart against any sort of word that divides brother from brother, sister from sister, because it undermines your willingness to love. Friends, I trust that in a room like this one and with students like you, the consensus is that we all want to be faithful servants of of Christ. We want to be useful to the Lord in the church and in the world, amen? We want to be useful. That certainly means We need to grow in our knowledge of scripture and of truth since God's word is all that we need for life and ministry. So that certainly means you ought to work hard on your studies. But it also means, friend, what I hope we've seen tonight is that godliness, personal holiness, even more than knowledge is what best equips us to minister God's word in a useful way. Flee impulsive immaturity, pursue self-controlled character, and guard your heart against words that divide. If we practice those things, friends, we will be vessels for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master, and ready for every good work. May God make it so in each of us. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, we do want to be useful in service to your church and in service to you in the world. And Father, we pray that you would forgive us of the times in which we prioritize other things rather than the pursuit of godliness. Lord, we pray that you would please help us to turn from sin and to be renewed, to be satisfied in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that you would encourage us with the truth of the gospel that we have indeed been cleansed from every sin. You have set us apart as holy, and now therefore we can be holy. God, please help us to grow. Please use us, Father, for your glory and for the good of others, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.